Well, I really want to begin by thanking uh, Mary Jo and Eric and Ivan for everything that you've shared. Um, nothing that we're going to be saying is going to be in any kind of conflict with each other because ethical principles never are. So there's many paths to doing the work and I have great respect for yours as I lay out mine. It'll be somewhat different because I'm an anarchist. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm an activist. I'm a social justice activist. So while I have a PhD and I'm welcome in those kind of spaces, I approach my work as an activist and my ethic is always one of uh, attempting to do justice in, an, in a decolonizing and an anti-oppressive way. Uh, so my relationship with um, psychology and therapy is, is very strained. Uh, and it's a, it's a partnership that I'm required to be in. I'm going to move your glass or else I'm going to drink from it, bro. <laughs> Which probably isn't the worst thing I could do. <laughs> if I steal a person, I'm Canadian, right? Like stealing water, not good. Stealing beer, uh, you know. <laughs> Want me to move. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, you're good. I also want to honor the land, and um, it's lovely to be um, in, a t in a place where that is a practice that happens that doesn't happen everywhere. Um, and Canada has a very similar uh, colonial, violent, genocidal history uh, that matches the history of New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. So we have a lot in common. So there'll be a lot of points of connection, but I'm also aware I have a very thick accent. Even for Canada, I have this kind of East End of Toronto kind of accent. Um, so if you can't understand me, metaphorically throw a pillow at me, or don't hurt me. And <laughs> it's not my first set of teeth, so try not to hit me in the face. <laughs> and, um, but if my accent's a problem, or the other thing is, you know, I, I'm going to be talking from a particular cultural context. And while there's a lot of parallels between um, Australia and Canada, there's very important and significant differences too, so I want to honor that. I am Canadian, which is a very problematic thing to say because politically I don't really hold much truck with uh, nation states. That said, I hold a passport for Canada and that is a massively privileged thing in this world. Um, wish the Australian government had thought about that a couple of days ago. I had a bit of trouble with my visa. <laughs> this is not a new experience for me. Um, but uh, when I say that I'm from Canada, I, I want to acknowledge that I know my boats. I know that my people are, there is no Canada. Canada's, I think, 140 years old. What the hell is that? <laughs> I work with survivors of torture. I had a Persian man say, honestly, seriously, 135 years of history? You call that history? <laughs> he said, we have 8,000 years of poetry. Anyway, um, so I think it's really important for everybody who is not um, an Inuit, uh, a Métis, or First Nations person in Canada has to acknowledge what their boat was, how their people got there. My people came from Ireland, England, and Newfoundland. Uh, my grandfather immigrated from Newfoundland before it was a part of Canada. So I am from immigrant and refugee stock um, when people were economic refugees. Now Canada is following Australia's plan to put up walls and those of us who got our boats here earlier want to make sure no one else gets to get off a boat, particularly people of color are not allowed to get off a boat. I'm one of the people who can pass as a Canadian, but you know, my two of my grandparents were immigrants themselves. Um, but because they're white immigrants, they were, their children became Canadians. But my you know, closest friends of love, our adopted family who are Iranian and are refugees, their children born in Canada will always be Iranian Canadians. So they'll always be hyphenated Canadians because they're not white. So I just want to acknowledge that I understand the history of my boats and that I work very hard to try to be as accountable as I can around colonization. This is, um, as activists in particular where I live in the Republic of East Vancouver, um, all of our organizing has to start with accountability to the land. So even though much of my work is with refugees and survivors of torture, my first accountability <laughs> is to the people of the land. Um, and this is my intention. I'm not saying that I hit this all of the time. I come to this work uh, with the violence of men uh, from as a feminist. And you have to understand that <laughs> feminism is the F word. Uh, when I talk about queer theory, people get very jazzed. Uh, I participate and belong peripherally to transgender and queer communities, although I'm a very queer passing straight girl. Um, People get really excited about queer theory, radical trans theory, critical disabled theory, critical race studies, it's all fabulous. And when I tell people, you know, most of this comes from feminism, they go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew she was gonna say that. <laughs> it was all going so good there. <coughs> then she dropped the F-bomb, you know. I'm from Scarborough and I've been known to drop the F-bomb, so I continue to throw the word feminism in. Um, it seems to piss people off a lot more than my tattoos. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to use the binary of men and women to talk about 
um, the impacts of men's violence. Uh, but I want you to know that I know the world is not actually that way. There aren't just men and women, because a binary understanding of gender that just talks about men and women disappears and invisibilizes the experiences and lives of people I love who are transgendered and gender variant. So I'm going to use the language of men and women, but I'll probably also include transgendered folks. The people, are people with that? Okay. Uh, in, I don't know about Australia, but this is just a kind of good guess that one of the things we do have in common, aside from the fact that people are outrageously excited about the visit of princes, <laughs> a really rich white guy who's never had to have a job or pay his own rent is here in town. <laughs> wow. Okay, so the, if he showed up in my hood, we would be tracking him as well, right? Uh, but anyway, so we have these kind of, we have this colonial past and we continue to replicate these, you know, this royalty and stuff while we say that we're holding these kind of other thoughts. But uh, these are the roots of colonization um, and capitalism for me. Uh, but one of the things that's true about Canada is that we live in a rape culture in Canada. And when I say that we live in a rape culture, I'm not trying to be offensive, or I'm not trying to be dramatic, or I'm not trying to get a response. I'm actually trying to do what Alan Jenkins talks about, but also Alan Wade, a response-based Canadian therapist who works with Linda Coates. And they talk, they've done a fabulous work about the language of violence. And what Alan Wade says was, we need to put words to deeds. And that's why I'm using the language of a rape culture. When I say that I live in a rape culture, I'm talking about the intersections of power. This is not just held up by patriarchy, which is the rule of men. It's held up by heteropatriarchy, which men are the ruling men, straight men are the ruling men, right? And not just heteropatriarchy, white supremacist men. It's particular men, in particular white supremacist men. And in Canada and in Australia, I would say, people who have access to a passport they don't even know is one of the most precious things on the planet. They take that privilege as a God-given right. Um, as well as a capitalist informed patriarchy. And when I'm talking about capitalism, we cannot, especially in Canada, I'm sure Australia's in the same boat, right now we are having the rape of Mother Earth in Canada on a scale that is one of the biggest global disasters that has ever happened, which is the tar sands of the province of Alberta. We have re reorganized everything around this. We've gotten rid of environmental protections. That's part of a rape culture, right? So we need to rape the earth for capitalism. This is all held up. So when I'm talking about Patreon, I'm talking about heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism and the rape of Mother Earth. And I, I'm sure, you know, it's, it's always complicated. And that too, that's what we're up against. Um, is this going okay? I'm just shaken because I'm so moved by your talk. So I'm gonna be shaky the whole time. That's just how, that's how I roll, man. <laughs> I'm gonna shake. Um, when I talk about a rape culture, Canadian statistics, Statistics Canada, the last time we asked statistics about uh, sexualized violence in Canada was 1993, and the numbers were so appalling that the government quit funding research into the rape of women, frankly, and then they c accused the girls of using bad numbers. Vicki, your numbers are so old. It's 1993. It's like, well, babe, that's a lot. That's when you cut the funding so that we can't do any more research. At that time, what came forward is one in three women in Canada is raped in their lifetime. And we know, like most statistics of violence, that is artificially low. Women do not tell. Women lie to researchers. Samoans lied to Margaret Mead <laughs> because she was a white supremacist, because she could not be. OK, so um, one in three women in Canada is raped as well. I've put these numbers on the board because they're so fantastic, you will think that you have not heard me right. OK, and despite the fact that Barbie, talking Barbie says, Math is too difficult. Girls actually understand numbers. <laughs> we do. And here's the numbers that we understand the most, right? Um, six to eight percent of rape is reported to police. And I think that's an artificially high number. Of that, 40 percent gets charge approval. That means the police officer agreed that it was rape. That's your point of departure, people. The police officer gets to decide whether they're going to approve the charge. Only 40% of this 6% actually get charge approval. Of that, two-thirds of that 40% goes to court. We're not talking about a lot of people here. 1.8 end in a conviction. And of the 1.8 where there's a conviction, only 0.8 of that, 1.8%, is their jail time. So when the government and legal systems tell us that there's legal apparatus that is going to help women be safe, we need to look at these kind of numbers. If that was a business, they would close you down. You are not, we all have to deliver measurable outcomes. 
Our work has to continually prove we're doing the claims that we're saying the police state is not keeping women safe. Not that locking men up does anything to keep me safe. I don't feel safe because my brothers who are poor, colonized and marginalized are getting locked up. We know which men are going to jail. That does not do anything to deliver safety to me, right? What that does is violate the dignity and humanity of another man. That's only bad for women. That's only bad for women. So one of the things Judith Herman said, and yes, I have her book too, and I, uh, this is me, right? That's you. <laughs> Thank goodness. One of the things Judith Herman says, there's a lot of things I don't like about Judith Herman, what she says. Judith is great as a person, I'm just saying, one of the things she says is she blames clients for infecting us with their hopelessness. I'm like, Judy, I don't think our clients hurt us. I think social structures of inequity and justice hurt us. Our clients are not the ones that hurt us. But she lays out a fabulous, framework for working with trauma without which I could not work, so I really do honor her work. We're all, we all have to be up for a critique though. What she says that I like too though, sexual assault is so prevalent that you actually cannot consider it deviant behavior. It's compliant behavior. When you have rape and sexualized assault on such a massive level, men who participate in it are not deviant, they're compliant. And that is absolutely terrifying to me. Okay, Wade and Kotu I talked about earlier have these kind of understandings of language that uh, I have used in the realm of how we understand how language has been used to promote a rape culture, okay? Well, here's the way that language works. This is this square here on the board, people. I knew I wouldn't be able to write, shake, and talk. Or spell. My spelling's bad anyway, but uh, I was forgiven for that all week. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, so here's the four operations of language or how language assists in promoting a rape culture. It obscures violence, hides the perpetrator's responsibility, hides the victim's resistance, and blames the victims. Police forces spend all kinds of money telling women how not to get raped. Have you been informed by the police on how not to be raped? Did you find it useful? Uh, one of the campaigns, and there are many of them, I want to know how many millions of dollars have gone into this. This is the money that's not going to rape crisis centers, right? This is money that's going to, to the police system for them to tell women how to not get raped. One of them came from Scotland, and the title of this 10-point information poster was Be Smart. You want to be smart. So what that means is if you get raped, you're stupid. You want to be smart. Oh, what was I thinking? I should have been smart yesterday. Wish, wow, I wish I'd had seen that poster first. Could have sharpened up the IQ. <laughs> um, the second thing on that is say no. Say no to any sex you don't want. <laughs> what has that got to do with rape? Rape and sex are in entirely different domains. One is in a consensual, intimate domain, one is an act of violence where one person is a perpetrator and acts upon another person because they have the power to do so. These are not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist people, honest to God I'm not, um, but these are not accidental campaigns. Every police force in the world seems to have one and they've all paid millions of dollars for them. This is not loose language. When you are told to say no to any sex you don't want by the police, in a poster against rape, you know that they cannot tell the difference between sex and rape. And the project of feminism over the last 4,000 years has been trying to differentiate rape from sex. We thought we kind of had a handle on it starting about 1975. And this is propaganda, absolute propaganda, to conflate rape and sex back together. And who's really reading this that I'm worried about are cops. Because look at that charge charge approval that comes from the cops. If the cops don't understand the difference between sex and rape and they're the ones who get to decide if this is going to be a charge, that's why the system's not delivering, that's one of the reasons the system's not delivering something. Although I think we would all agree that the justice system, it cannot deliver safety from rape for men, women, trans people or children. Right? Okay, we're not looking to the justice system. We're going to look to society. Anyway, when we look at these kind of things, oh, the second thing that it said on this list is use the buddy system to keep other women safe. So whose job is it to keep women safe from men and rape other women, okay? Well, you know, it is absolutely wild if you look at the ways that language is used to promote a rape culture. In terms of obscuring violence, they've taken rape and now put it in the realm of sex. And now it's a matter of whether or not we consented. Oh, what was I thinking? I should have said no to sex I didn't want. Thanks, guys, that was so useful, right? Um, hiding the perpetrator's responsibility. There are no tips to men. The police have not put out 10 tips on men to men. The information is for women, so the responsibility is entirely for the woman to not get raped. What our society teaches, what my society teaches is, 
do not get raped. It doesn't teach, don't rape. Okay, and hiding the victim's resistance is as if we're pieces of plastic who are acted upon by men. As, and all of our resistance is not seen. When they talk in court, they often talk about how women did not fight back. Every boy, man, trans person or woman who is raped fights back 100%. Resistance is always present when there's oppression and people resist to every level that they can. When a man has a knife at your throat and says don't scream, you prudently stay silent. That's an act of resistance for your life. That's not not fighting back and it's not consent, right? Mm. I'm just shaking because this stuff's so horrible. Okay. Um, if we, uh, you know, police have not given any advice to men, but happily feminists have. So you can Google this and you'll see some good stuff. But there's some posters made by women's activist groups and some good accountable men as well and trans folks um, who are giving some advice to men. And, here, and here's the first thing that it has. They have 10 points too. And the first point is, if you stop to help a woman and her car's broken down, don't rape her. <laughs> Perfect, hey? And the second one that I really like, because men were holding up these signs during slut walk protests. We had a lot of really good accountable men and trans men and transgendered folks who were walking alongside feminists um, contesting these ideas from the cops. And one guy, I took a picture of a man with a sign that says, use the buddy system. If you can't trust yourself in public to not sexually assault someone, keep a friend with you. <laughs> now this seems ludicrous and patronizing and really an attack on the honorable culture of men. We, this is not real, you could not, women do not tell men how to act. It's, you know, but the cops saying exactly the same things to women somehow flies, right? So I'm not, I'm, you know. Um, okay, you know, feminists are not the only one, uh, feminists are not the people who think that all men are rapists. That is not what I think as a feminist. Do you know who thinks that all men are rapists? Rapists believe that all men are rapists. And when people did research in jails of men who are convicted of rape, and we're talking about very few men, the men, uh, Eric, I think you would put on the other side of the room, whether or not who they thought, they, they would say all men are rapists. All men are rapists, I just got caught, and other guys are just lying about it, and women love it. And, they, and what's their evidence for this is rape jokes. And what is wrong with rape jokes is not that they're not funny. What's wrong with rape jokes is that it promotes a rape culture. And what rapists almost consistently said is, when rape is joked about, which it always is when men are alone, and you girls wouldn't know that, um, other men never intercede and all men laugh. Because all men are raping women. It's what we do, it's biological, boys will be boys. So that's what's wrong with rape jokes, and isn't it interesting to see, you know, women are often, especially feminists, are attacked as saying they're, they're man haters and we think all men are rapists. The people who really believe that all men are rapists are rapists, are men who commit rape. Um, okay. Okay. Um, now, look, I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes it possible for me to work with men who have used violence. For me, I have to say, I love men. I love men. And I come from an extended, fabulous family with really good, accountable men. I have a lot of brothers, cousin brothers. My father's a good man. I have uncles, grandfathers. So I have had a massive privilege of seeing not perfect men, but good men, and men who hold each other to account, and men who've made amends. My brothers are fabulous fathers. My nephews are really good men. And this amplifies my hope. Just as your talk, I told you, like it just amplifies my hope that men can be accountable. I believe in the, cultural of account the culture of accountable men. That's actually at the heart of my work. Without that, I don't think I could effectively work with men. I don't think I could work with men in an ethical way. I think I would do harm, and I think I would oppress men. If I didn't believe in the culture of accountable men, I think I would abuse my power as a therapist, and I think I would you know, replicate some dominance over men, uh, which is extremely possible. When you're the therapist, you're holding a lot of power. So we have to have that kind of analysis. So I really believe in the culture of accountable men. I'm also an activist. And as an activist, uh, I hold an anti-colonial and an anti-oppressive stance. So my aim is to never replicate oppression. Uh, so with this man I'm meeting with, I don't want to oppress him. Um, especially when I'm meeting with Aboriginal men, poor men, and men who don't have shelter. These are most of the men that I work with. I hold huge places of privilege and so if we organize our work just that I'm a woman and you're a man and we're meeting around men's violence, then that client, that man, has to be accountable to me. But the reality is that there's an intersection of power going on here. I'm housed. I'm safe. 
I'm the therapist. I don't do much well. I swim good. I do therapy good. I can't drive. I don't own a phone because I don't know how to use them. Um, I loved it when they were plugged into the wall. I know those days are gone. Um, but I, when I'm meeting a man who's been used violence in relationship, I am at the height of my power. This is something I do very well. And he's there because he can't manage his life. That is the intersection of power I most want to be accountable to. That's how I'm able to hold myself accountable. That's how I'm able to be of use to men. I don't start with an access of power that says he's a man and he's been violent. I'm a woman and I've experienced the violence of men in my life. So he needs to be accountable to me. That's not useful or helpful. The, the love, therapeutic love and compassion for that man is at the heart for me. If I don't have therapeutic love and compassion for that man and I don't believe in the culture of accountable men, I can't do this work. It's unethical for me to do this work and I'm going to do harm. And who is going to pay for this are going to be the women and children in this man's life and this man. If he hurts them, the men I work with, they're going to jail. They're not men who get to hide behind the privilege when they use these kind of things. I have to address power. Addressing power is one of the things I need to have in order for me to be able to work with men. Um, so I, what I was saying is I know that I have power in these relationships and I try to make that public. And I'm look, looking at the intersections of power, especially poor men and institutionalized men. Many of the men that I work with have been in jail for 20 years in Canada, which is what you get for murder. Um, so when people come out of, when men come out of jail, they've been institutionalized. I know they have been harmed. I do, I'm an anti, I'm a jail abolitionist. I don't think it serves women to jail men. We have flawed options in terms of what we can do. So it's not that I think everybody should get off and not go to court or go to jail, but what we're doing in jail is dehumanizing and which men are the men who are going to jail. Poor men are the men in particular who are going to jail and poverty is always organized around colonization race, right? Okay, the other thing I need to think about is, damn it, just Paulo Freire. You know, I get a lot of what I get uh, comes from the therapy community, which has taken so much from the Global South activist communities. Um, Paulo Freire talked about dialogue being something in which I'm only in dialogue with a man when I am not oppressing him. If I'm abusing my power in any way in a conversation with a man, we're not having a dialogue. I'm doing violence to him. What you were talking about, I think, so eloquently earlier. What makes it possible for me to work with men who've been violent is the work that I did against the death penalty in the United States. Long before I was a therapist, and I gotta tell you, I'm still kind of wake up some days and think, oh my God, I'm Dr. Reynolds, I'm a therapist, this is a hoot. Because uh, I kind of, I'm a very anti-therapy therapist, you may imagine. I do believe in change, and I think that therapy can be useful, but I approach my work, of course, as a, as a political activist. In my work against the death penalty in the United States, I became involved in that because I think when nation states that claim to be democracy kill their own citizens, we're talking about the most egregious thing a state can do. If you can kill your citizens, you can do anything. So I thought as a political activist that that would be, you know, the most important point for me to get to engage with my activism. So that's what I became involved in while I was work living in the United States um, and continued to do that work when I returned to Canada. Um, what I learned about, and this is hard for me to talk about, <laughs> what I learned about men on death row is that people are so much more than the worst thing they've ever done. People are so much more than the worst thing they've ever done. Men on death row are not murderers. They're men who've murdered someone. They're third base players. They're someone's father. They're somebody's son. They might be guitar players. They're poets. Sometimes they're innocent men. Sometimes they're guilty men. But they're human beings. And there's so much more to a human being than the one act that we use to define who they are. Every man I worked for on death row in the United States was executed. Several of them were innocent. The United States government has acknowledged that they're willing to execute the innocent. One of those men was Roger Keith Coleman. He was executed almost 20 years ago. Roger Keith Coleman had committed rape as a young man and did time as a rapist. The fact that he had been uh, accused of rape and found guilty and done time for that was used to construct his identity as a monster. Because he was a monster, even though he was found guilty, and later they, just, they, they even found out that he was innocent before they executed him, and the state appeal was called the right to execute the innocent, which the Supreme Court of the United States upheld, that the United States was allowed to execute the innocent because there were loopholes in his appeal process. 
So we knew that he was an innocent man, but they'd constructed him as a monster. In order for a democracy to kill its people, you have to construct them as less than human. And this is why all language that calls people pedophiles or violent men or rapists and creates an identity construction of a man based on the worst thing that he's ever done, this is all shouldering up the death penalty and the use of violence by the state. So that's why we have to take it apart on every level. We have to not participate in that. So the fact that Roger Keith Coleman had been seen as a rapist and constructed as a monster and dehumanized, that's what made it possible to kill him. One of the things I still shake about is the fact that we killed this man in the name of women's safety. That is not what feminism wants, that's not what I wanted, that doesn't serve justice, right? So we have to be really careful in the feminist community as well, and good men who are working as our allies as well as transgendered folks, that our activism is going to be used by the state for its own ends. For example, in the work that we've done at the Rape Crisis Center on gang rape, one of the responses to these kind of things is the police create a task force on gang rape. So there's, you can't imagine how much money that cost. So the money that's not going into the Rape Crisis Center is going into more police mechanisms. You see what I mean? And they're telling us that this is delivering safety. It's delivering this kind of safety. And this person that's locked up, that doesn't change my safety on the street at all. That's not doing anything to dismantle a rape culture. In fact, I know that man is going to be disrespected. His dignity is going to be attacked in jail. And who is going to pay the price of that? Women and children are going to pay the price of that, and other men who have less access to power than that man. So I believe in bell hooks. Do you know bell hooks? Radical black um, educator from the United States. And bell hooks talks about the fact that feminism is for everybody. And I really believe this. Feminism is for everybody, men, women, and transgendered and gender variant people. Um, I supervise a rape crisis center, and I have always worked with men who are violent. And I do not see in any way that these are competing projects. I will say that when I, uh, in my work against the death penalty, I had to answer to a lot of feminists who were questioning me for the fact that I was defending rape. I was even told at one point I was pro-rape. I was like, you're on to me. That's what I'm about. <laughs> I knew someone was going to figure this out. It's like, I am not defending rapists and I'm not defending rape. I am resisting state killings, which is a state abuse of power. If we look at systemic issues of violence, we know in the United States, for example, the states that have the most killings, their homicide rates are the highest. In Canada, we ended the death penalty in 1962. Our homicide rates have gone consistently down. What is up is fear, and what is up is the reporting of violent crime. But violent crime is actually down. The building of prisons is up. In Canada, one of three people in prison right now is an asylum seeker. That's what the new prison industrial complex is about. They're not going to stop building prisons. They've just got new ideas about who's going in there. Okay, I think I, that was a rant. Was that a <laughs> little, bit of a, little bit of a rant? Sorry. Time for water. Get back. <laughs> hmm. um, I work with survivors of rape at the Rape Crisis Center, and I have always, as a drug and alcohol counselor, I've always worked with survivors of rape. And I've always worked with young men who are struggling with drug and alcohol, who are also the survivors of rape, but who also are young men who may have perpetrated rape or at least coercive sex. Where People tell me sometimes I train a lot of therapists, I teach at the master's level and in college and do a lot of supervision. I, I just couldn't work with people who, who molest children. I can't work with people who are rapists. And I'm like, well, who are you going to work with? Where are you going to work? How'd you get to work today? On the bus? Who do you think's on the bus? We're in a rape culture. Who do you think is doing this? You know, and what people think about is only stranger danger. You know, there's this some image of a guy who's obviously poor with a knife who's going to jump out of a bush. That's not actually the, con the construction of violence in our society. So we've, we're all working with, quote, these men. We are this society. You know, you spoke yourself about being um, violated by women. Like, we are the people that we serve. This is our society. This is our, this is our role to do. So for me, there's never been... And there's never been an ethical tension between supervising a rape crisis center and working with men who've perpetrated violence against women and children. It's the same, it is the same work. The, work. the goal is to dismantle a rape culture. The goal is to have a society where everybody is safe. Um, and I hold the survivors of rape very close to me, and I bring them in the room with me, metaphorically, when I work with men. So that in the whole time that I have a conversation with the men, I'm sitting there wondering, what is Julie making of my conversation right now? How am I honoring and dignifying Julie in my efforts to dignify Joe? Because you know what? We can hold those things in attention. It's not either or. It's going to serve all of us 
to dismantle a rape culture. So that's why I do this. I use the language of perpetrator and victim in very particular ways. I don't want to give up that language because I think it's very important in particular events to be able to name who did what to whom. Um, see, I used whom. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have a degree in English. It's just it's my only language and I'm kind of messy with it. Um, but um, so I use the words of perpetrator and victim, but I don't mean them as identity constructions. This person is not a perpetrator. In this event, they perpetrated the violence. This woman is not a victim. In this event, she was the, vi the victim of this violence. Okay, so they're not identity constructions. When I work with men and young men who've used violence in relationship, rape and coercive sex, I want to hold them 100% responsible for their actions and what they're responsible for. Um, and I also studied with Alan Jenkins almost 18 years ago. I came, my first trip to Australia, I spent a lot of time uh, with Alan and inside of his work and we, we have yeah, last year when I came, I did a solidarity group with his team, and we have some really great connections. But there's a really important points of departure in our work as well, because I'm an anarchist. Um, so I want to hold men 100% responsible for their actions, but that is within a particular political context. And when we're talking about patriarchy, misogyny, which is the hate of women, and a rape culture that's held up by heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism, and environmental, environmental violence. That man is responsible for his actions, but he is not responsible for being brought into that context. Our boys are being raised in a rape culture, and then we're individually holding them responsible as if they invented misogyny. They didn't invent misogyny, they're swimming in it. I think about this about myself and my position about racism and colonization. I will not say that I'm a non-racist person. I'd love to say that, but you know, <laughs> it would just be a truth claim I couldn't back up with facts. I grew up in a very racist society, in a very racist culture. I'm white-skinned person of settler culture in a, in a territory uh, that was stolen from indigenous folks, meaning First Nations people, Métis people, and Inuit people, and the way that that was taken was genocide. So the territory is saturated in the blood of indigenous people in Canada, for which there's been no accountability. How can you, be non, how can you make a claim to be non-racist in this territory? What I, the best that I can do is take a position against racism, and I know because I swim in racism and I'm in a country based on genocide and colonization, that every if I haven't set an intention and work hard in a moment to not be racist, I may achieve it. But the moment I let down my guard or don't attend to racism, I will replicate it. How can I expect a 14-year-old boy to do more? and to not replicate a rape culture and a misogynist culture that is the only, that's the culture he swims in and breathes in. He's responsible for his actions, but not for the social context. And I think as an activist, that's where activism is part of it. As activists, we believe it is our collective obligation to change the structures of inequity, the structures of social injustice that promote a rape culture. And I see continually therapists put this on the shoulders of young boys. And I think that that is actually therapeutic violence. And it doesn't serve that young man. And it then, if we don't serve this young man who's willing to talk to us, women and children are going to pay forever for that. And he is going to suffer. All of our suffering is connected, as is all our liberation. right? Our paths to liberation are, are connected with each other. So I, while I want to hold people 100% responsible for what they do, I don't want, they are not responsible for the social context. Um, and the other thing is when I work with men who've been violent and young boys who've been sexually coercive, for example, um, I don't begin with their accountability for violence. I ask them where they learned about violence. Do you know I've never met a man who invented violence? <laughs> Every man I've ever worked with it was the victim of violence first. They experienced violence on the body. That's how they were, that's how they were trained up in the ideas of violence. And so we have to start here first. Um, I was the supervisor of the Center for Survivors of Torture. And you know, when survivors of torture, because they're men like any other man, when they hit their wives, the police come. And the police do take them away. And they lose their asylum status. The response is amazing. Women of color, refugee women and migrant women and asylum seeking women came to me and said, you're white and you know how to talk in your language in a way that gets listened to. We need you to talk to police about the fact that they have to understand that men 
who are the victims of political violence and torture are not just beating their wives. They're having a flashback and then the neighbor phones. These are not women who would ever phone the police. They do not expect the police to be protecting them. It is a real sight of privilege to think that if you call the police, their first interest is your safety. Many people never have that privilege, in particular poor people, people of color and asylum seekers. These women would never call the cops, but their neighbors hear a fight and they call the cops. What's been happening is a flashback or he's reenacting um, you know, he's having a psychological experience based on the political violence he has suffered or the torture he has suffered, and the police see it as a domestic violence situation, which it is and isn't. It's just more complicated than that. He gets charged, he loses his status, everybody loses in these situations. So that's how I started to begin to have to separate. I want to hold those men 100% accountable for what they do, but I don't start by saying, you know, while you're in a flashback, you hit your wife. I don't start like that. I start back here. We have to find a space of dignity and honor for this man and the violence that he experienced and suffered and how that is part of what's going on in his choices of his behavior to hit his wife. And for that, he's 100% responsible. Um, oh, is this going okay? Okay, thanks. It's, um, it's really important uh, that all men who've used violence are held accountable um, for the women and children who are the victims of their violence. And what's required for this is good clinical supervision from women and accountability to women. I haven't, I haven't worked with anybody who wanted to hurt their children. When I, when I talk with men, I always ask them about when they found out they're going to be fathers. I'm not a parent, so I'm nuts about parents. It's like a whole world of people I just don't know. So I get kind of, you know, excited. So I exoticize parents. I think it's fabulous. I'm like, how? Wow! What was that like when you found out you were going to be a dad? And I asked them, if, you know, it's a fabulous, loving, moving, connecting conversation. And then they're like, really? You don't have kids? Wild. You seem like such a decent, together, normal person. <laughs> but you're obviously missing the boat because it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And then I asked them, if somebody had told you at that time that when that child is four, you're going to rape that child, what would you have thought of that? And it's usually a very shaming and an, an enabling shame, as Alan Jenkins would say. It's a very shaming moment. Shame, and this is from Alan Wade, shame speaks to a knowing of right and wrong. That presence of shame speaks to the fact that this is not in line with this person's ethics and they know that this is wrong. So I haven't worked with men who wanted to hurt their kids. Um, and um, I invite men to take positions and then I hold it to it. And Janella Bird taught me that. Janella Bird, who's a feminist therapist and a narrative therapist in New Zealand, she says, I ask men if they, what they want. They tell me they want fair and equal relationships, and then I hold them to it, and that's what I try to do. I want to honor them and do dignity to them. Um, and, and because I'm a woman, I think I'm really well resourced to do that. I am held up, like I told you, by uh, an extended family of good, accountable men and loving, strong women. Um, and so I'm able to sit with this and one of the questions I'm able to ask men is, what is it like for you to be able to sit in this difficult conversation with me as a woman and admit that you have done violence against women? What's it say about you that you're willing to have this conversation with me? Because it says a great deal. So some of the, I mean, this is a conversation Alan Jenkins and I had 20 years ago. You know, he didn't believe at that time it was the, that women could do this work. And it was like, I don't think it's our gender that qualifies us for the work. It's our ethical positioning, and I think an activist um, positioning and a political analysis that makes it possible to do this kind of work. Um, we didn't talk about this last time we met. I'll bring it up when I'm in Adelaide. So I, I, need, I believe that I need to work with men who use violence because I work with children and youth and in particular those who struggle with drugs and alcohol. And as everybody has said, drug and alcohol programs don't tell the funding bodies this. It's never about drugs and alcohol. It's always about oppression and exploitation. That I work with children who have suffered oppression and exploitation, not children who have chemical addictions. Um, but you know what? All of them need their fathers. I need my father. My father, Bill Reynolds, is 86 this year. I just missed his birthday because I'm abroad. Um, and I know the world would be an empty place when my father's not on it. I, my father and my mother are my biggest teachers. I had thought it was my education because I'm a working class person and not many of us get to school. And so when you get to school, you credit school with your learnings. But of course, looking back, it's like I learned these things from my father, who was my first teacher on dignity, and my mother. All the children I work with, all the youth I work with. And you know when guys, when boys get to be 6'2", First Nations boys who are 6'2 and look scary, people don't see them as children, these are little boys and they have no father. We need to be able to find a way back for men into the lives of their children. I believe in this very strongly. I'm not saying a man who has raped his child gets to go cuddle his baby again. That's not what I'm talking about, but he needs to have his role as a father back. So I'm gonna quickly tell you one little piece of work I did with one man. 
So I work in the downtown east side of Vancouver. It's the most um, impoverished area of Canada. It's the heroin capital of North America. Um, it's the poorest place in Canada outside of First Nations Reserve. Most of the people I'm working with there are under sheltered. Men have been in prison, things like this. I'm working with a man who had raped his child and did jail time and came out and felt that he actually, his drug and alcohol use was about killing himself and it wasn't suicide. He felt that society had passed a death sentence on him as a pedophile, which we have. We are complicit in this. We think these men should kill themselves and actively in jail people try to kill them, right? So that's what he was doing is he was going to kill him. He was going to be killed by drugs and alcohol as a sentence against the fact that he was a pedophile. And I, the only way to, now my, he is my client. My care is for him. My compassion is for him to save his life and keep him on this planet and make room for him to belong. You know, I don't believe in the death penalty. I don't think anybody's life should be taken by the state. I believe in everybody's right to be here, no matter what the worst act that they've ever done is. I, and I also believe we need to find better ways to make other people safe from everybody, but I don't think the answer is ever to kill somebody. So I told him that. He was shocked to hear that. Uh, he didn't anticipate that that would be my position. And um, the way out of that for that man, the way out of death for that man was to get his job back as a father. He said, Victoria. The older men always call me Victoria. Victoria. How am I going to get my job back as a father? I've raped my child. And I said, what is the job of a father? I'm not a parent, so you've got to help me with this. He goes, well, um, you've got to love your kid. That's the heart of it. And I said, well, do you love your child? And he said, yes. You know, you can love your child and hurt your child. And therapists do a lot of violence when we tell people you don't love your child, you hurt your child. Both these things are happening. More than one thing can be happening at one time. He did still love his child. And then what we did is we came up with a plan of how he was going to show love for his child. Here's the plan we made. If he ever walked into a mall, which he wouldn't be able to do, security would stop him. He's missing his teeth, he's tattooed, and he's poor, and he's a person of color. So he's not going to get into a mall. But if he ever got to walk into a mall and his son was there, his job would be to turn around immediately and leave so his son never had to see him again. Because he loves his son, and that's what his son has asked for, to never see him again. He loves his son and remembers his birthday and gets a birthday card and writes it to him every year and does not mail it because his, he is, his job as a father is to love his son on his birthday and to acknowledge it, and his son does not want to hear from him, so he doesn't. See, you can get your job back as a father without offending the person you've perpetrated against. What the victim wants is what has to be at the center, but that does not mean that men are not allowed to get their jobs back as fathers. We have to find ways for people, we have to find ways back for men. I really believe this. Um, uh, yeah, I think I already told you, when people tell me that they don't work with men who are violent, I wonder what they think they're doing. Anyway. Um, I think also, I just want to say also, I think men can be fabulous therapists to women who've experienced men's violence. I've supervised some really accountable men in the downtown east side who were quote drug and alcohol counselors and some of their caseload were women who were involved in survival sex trade work who had been the victims of men's violence throughout their life. Women don't just end up in those positions. Um, and these men were, they had that cold fear in the belly as therapists that they were in some way going to transgress against these women who had been the victims of men's violence. And I said, that's required, that cold fear in the belly, that terror you have that you may harm a woman, that's actually required for a man to be a therapist with a woman who's experienced men's violence. And so I, uh, and they were getting supervision from a woman who has a feminist background, that's why they sought me out. Um, and what I did is I do living supervision. Who you get your real supervision from are your clients. So what I did is I had a conversation with my dear friend Andrew Larkham. He's the man, he's the man therapist. And the client, who's a woman who is involved in survival sex trade and also been the victim of men's violence. So I have Andrew just listen and I interview the woman about the therapeutic relationship and what comes forward for, and ways that it's useful, ways it's not useful, and what comes forward is this is the first relationship she can remember that she's in a relationship with a man where she's being respected. And she knows that he has never checked out her body. He's been very careful, in fact, to open the door for her, but always go first so that she doesn't have to, and this is her words, she doesn't have to think he's checking out her ass, you know? And that he has, this is the first man she remembers who holds her dignity and the care of her is at the center of the relationship. She's not been in a relationship like that. You can see how much trauma this is healing just by being in a relationship with an accountable man. It's not to tell her the world's safe, trust men. It's that there is a culture of accountable men 
all men are not going to hurt you. The world is not a totally terrifying place that you are not allowed to be a part of, right? So I think it's really important, not just that women can work with men in accountable ways, but that men can work with women. And I don't think, um, I don't think that it's our gender that qualifies us for our work, but nor should it disqualify us, right? And transgender folks also are fabulous people to work across genders because they do just by their very presence, question what it is to be a man, to be a woman, to decide that you're something else, a gender variant person, or someone outside the gender binary. Um, when I work with women, though, I'll say this. I always say to women, if you're going to work with men who are violent, you've got a lot of work to do because you need to find out about the culture of masculinity. You don't know about it. Think about it as any cross-cultural work you do. You've got to do your homework. We have to be qualified to walk into the room. And so one of the things I tell people to do is read Susan Faludi's book, Stiffed. The Betrayal of the American Male. Susan Faludi is a feminist who wrote Backlash and then later was going to write a book and she, what she wanted to do was just lay out how violent men are. So what she did is she attended a lot of your guys' groups. So she went and attended all kinds of men's groups of men who were violent. She expected to hear men being bastards, frankly, and misogynists and all kinds of stuff. And what did she hear? Powerlessness and pain and histories of oppression, and in particular, economic oppression, where all the factories have closed, and all of a sudden, the, what is held up as how to be a man has been lost. Their ability to be a man in that culture is gone. And yes, they're 100% responsible for the violence they perpetrate against their women partners and their children, but they're not responsible for the fact that society has said, You're no, you are no longer men, and you no longer have a place. So there is always this kind of structure behind it. So I invite everybody to read that, because it really helped me to understand some of the, some of the culture of men. Um, I think what's required is excellent supervision and accountability uh, to power. Um, an ability to have compassion and hold the dignity of the person you're working with, hold the dignity of that man and care for him and belonging on the planet. We have to be able to hold that. Men who have raped their children, men who have hurt their wives, they are so close to suicide. They do not want to do this. This is against everything they believe in and being men. Our job is to hold them on, the, on this planet and to tell them that there's a place for them. If we don't have the capacity to do that, we're not qualified to do the work. And then it's easy for us to say, he wasn't ready to make change. But what's happened is we haven't walked in the room with everything that we need to have. We need to hold this care, compassion, and dignifying of men alongside experiences of the victims of violence. I want to always hold up the dignity of the victim of violence at the same time, right? Because not just these victims of violence, but the potential future victims of a man's violence. Bad therapy is so much worse than no therapy. If we do therapeutic harm, if people are in institutions <laughs> like prisons where they get harmed, more women are going to pay the price of that. Um, and Ivan, in his work with um, Eric, I was talking about it's, it's not just enough. There's not enough that's done for men. And, there's, and that is very true. And one of the things that happens is we're set up against each other as men and women, as if giving resources to men is going to steal resources from women. And this is about us being the dogs under the table fighting over the bones. You know the military who are having their party in your harbor did not throw a bake sale for that. There's tons of money for the military industrial complex. There's no shortage of money for the prison industrial complex. There is more money and resources, and we all need it. So I really try to defy this competition that feminism is set up against um, trying to be accountable to men. There's got to be room for all of us in care, because it's all one project. For me, I actually kind of don't separate my work against rape and my work with men. It's all, the same, it's all the same work. We're in the same society. And as an activist, I continue to work to try to change the structures of inequity that promote a rape culture. I know it's really complicated to hold these things in tension, a compassion and care and therapeutic love for men who've been uh, violent alongside a compassion and dignifying and accountability to the women who've been the victim. But as anarchists say, you know, we can walk and chew gum. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.